Hey, we kicked off a brand new series last week called We Are Free. Everybody say free. free. We're free. And we're looking at the life of David and seeing how God has a plan for each and every person. It's not a question if God has a plan. The question is, are we willing to follow through with the plan that he has for us? God loves us so much that he didn't make us robots. He gives us free will. We can choose to follow him or not. And we see this beautifully played out in the life of David. It wasn't all good. There was some bad, but God continued to use him because he was a man after God's own heart. Listen, that should speak to you today because if you walk in here with a bunch of brokenness and a bunch of shame and guilt, look no further than the man after God's own heart who is David, who is a murderer and adulterer, yet he loved God. There's a plan and purpose for each and every one of you, and I want you to know that here today. Last week, we looked at this idea of how we're free from the approval of others. Today, I want to talk to you about this idea of being free from fear. And I know some of you right now, as soon as I said that, you're like, I hate you. Because fear is your story. Fear is what you walked in with. And I, I want you to know that while we understand that, we'll, we'll study that today. If you've walked in here with the lens that everything is fearful and that you're just going to always be this way, I want you to know there's only two voices in this world. One is God, one is Satan. And when the word tells us to fear not over and over and over again, matter of fact, some scholars believe, it's, it's a little bit up in the debate, but some believe that there's the, the, the expression fear not 365 times in scripture. One for each day of the year. So when you wake up, no matter what your schedule consists of, whether it's summer break or going back to it in the fall, you know the same God who is with you on your day off is the same God with you on Sunday morning, so therefore I can fear not. But it doesn't mean it's the absence of fear. Listen, faith is only demonstrated in the midst of fear. It's not faith that there's no fear. Faith is in the midst of the fear. I'm gonna trust you. And David knew as much as anyone, what that was like, both as a shepherd and as someone who showed up on the scene to see Goliath, the, the champion Philistine, punking out the Israelite army as he's just a boy bringing his brother some food. With that in mind, we read 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 32 through 51. It'll be a little bit of scripture. It says, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Did you know that annoying person who shows up on the scene? Are you scared? I got this. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears and tigers, oh my, no, it's not in there. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defiled, excuse me, defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented, all right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and coat. This is important, listen to it. Of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested of Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from the stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with the shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked over toward David with the shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with the stick? And he cursed David by the names of his little g-gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. And David replied to, to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, the heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Today, the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head, and then I will give you the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, 
And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. I, I want somebody to know here today, we're not talking about a battle against flesh and blood. We're talking about the Lord's battle. He will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd bag and taking out a stone. He hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. Father, I pray today that your Holy Spirit would move in such a powerful way. God, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture that many non-church going people are familiar with, but Lord, do not allow the familiarity of this passage to become just noise today. I know you have a word. Father, you began to show me this last night. Lord, there's gonna be people free here today. I know it. And so God, just help me get out of the way and would you help people know there's freedom in you. Father, we love you. We pray this in your name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Hey, glad that you guys are here with us. I do want to go ahead and just reiterate what was on the screen earlier, Pastor Selena. On July 23rd, everybody say the 23rd. Here at the auditorium at 3 o'clock, we will be voting on the new building that we're going to be building here in Marshfield, Missouri. And I just want you to know, God is providing for our church. Isn't it awesome to be a part of a church where our God is providing in every single area possible? So make sure to come. Being a, box, a professional boxer's kid, you can imagine confidence was something that was instilled within me at a young age. And I remember watching my dad train for these fights. It was something I loved to do. He would go out to the, to the garage, and, and I would watch him train. I would go with him into the, uh, go into Springfield where he would actually train with the different trainers. It was something I loved to do. And I remember just you know, certain lines my dad would tell me as a kid time and time again. It was annoying at the time, but he would tell me things that would just begin to try to just instill this confidence and this belief in myself. I didn't know God, and we, I wasn't raised in a, a godly home, so therefore I didn't know that God was the source of my strength. But one of the lines that my dad would always tell me, and it sounds weird if you don't know the context, he would say, Deej, he said, I put my pants on just like they put their pants on. I know you're thinking, what does that even mean, right? And what he was getting at was whoever I'm training against, or who I'm training for, should I say, even if they're bigger, faster, tougher, and stronger, he goes, Deej, all I can do is go in and put the work in. I can be the meanest and I can give everything I have. And so as a kid, that was something I remember. I put my pants on just like they put their pants on. He would tell me this, hey, they bleed just like I bleed, right? And so I mean, that was my mindset playing sports and different things. And so, you know, I grew up in Marshfield most of my life. But then when I moved to Springfield, it was a brand new scenery, right? There was People who I'd never seen before, skin colors I'd never seen before, man, just slang that I'd never heard before. I was just this country boy. And as you can imagine, I'm not country. But to everyone else, I was country, right? And so I would go, I remember playing Mighty Might football on the north side of Springfield, right? And I was a little bit intimidated because I, nobody knew me. Nobody knew if I was good or not. Nobody cared, you know, who, you know, what my last name was. And so I get out there, and the very first practice, I'll never, for, never forget this, man, I realized that the biggest person in the entire league was on our team. His name was Keandre. I got news for you. You don't have a name called Keandre and not be the baddest dude there. <laughs> and so there's Keandre, and he's looking at me, and he's like my Goliath. I'm like, dang. He's like, who is this country bumpkin, right? And so the very first day of practice, we have these head-to-head -head drills that don't really accomplish anything other than we're going to see who can hit each other the, the hardest, right? And so I remember Keandre, just like Goliath, right, just kind of walking like, who's going to come at me, right? Who are these little boys? And I remember being like, I ain't. And then, man, I just began to think. I'm like, he bleeds just like I bleed. Man, he put his pants on just like I put my pants on, right? And I was like, maybe, just maybe I can just give it a shot, right? Like, man, this could be my day. And then I was like, but he's huge. And his name's Keandre, and my name is Dylan. Big difference. <laughs> And so there he was, man, twice my size. And I remember the coach says, who wants it? And then, man, I just, I was like, oh, I didn't want to, but I wanted to. You ever been there, right? And I'm like, I got it. And then I looked in, the, in my peripherals. My dad was there. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no, right? And I started to talk myself out of it. I'm like, here's the deal. My dad's going to just ring me out on the way home if I just got scared and punked out, right? And so I remember there we were head to head. He was here. 
or he was there and I was there, and we ran full speed. And I knew my best bet was to put my helmet in his helmet as hard as I could, which is not what you're supposed to do. But I, I went and I speared him and I hit him as hard as I could. And I remember just closing my eyes and I felt this pop and I didn't know what happened. And I was like, I am stuck. And about that time I look and Keandre is just looking at me. I was like, hey. He's like, hey, get off me. He goes, I can't. Help, right? And little did I realize that we hit each other so hard that our helmets broke and we were stuck. And so the paramedics, no, but like literally, <laughs> you had two dads pulling us off. I didn't win that battle, but he didn't either. <laughs> and about that time, I hear my dad go, that's my boy. And I went back, acting like I was fine, but I was like, I ain't hitting Keandre again this season. Man, I remember that. Put my pants on just like he put his pants on. His were bigger than mine. But I did it. I didn't win, but I didn't lose. And what I remember about that, and what's crazy, is all throughout my years, now I'm 30 years old, I was 12 years old at that point in time, I remember those little things. I might not win, I might not be the, I remember my dad telling me time and time again, you're never going to be the fastest, you're never going to be the strongest, you're never going to be, I'm like, why is he telling me that? But he was trying to get me to understand there's always going to be somebody bigger than you, tougher than you. That's not what makes a champion. That's not what makes a warrior, Deach. It's the ability to stand up in the midst of the battle and say, I'm not scared. I might not win, but I'm not going to be scared. And I'm here to tell some of you today, I'm not talking about going against Keandre. So I know every time I saw him from that day forward, we just nodded in appreciation. But see, I think some of you, you have your Goliaths. You have your Keandre's. You have those words spoken over you in the negative light or the positive light, and you want to be brave, you want to be a warrior, but if you're being honest, you just haven't been. Or maybe you have been at one point in time, but right now you're in this season where you feel like, I just don't have the courage to step up to this Goliath because I don't have it within me. And I want you to know what's so amazing about our God is He's not looking for us to rely on our own strength and our own intellect. He's simply looking for us to believe that our heavenly father is right there with us saying, listen, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Be strong and courageous because I am your God. I knew my dad couldn't go in for me against Keandre, but I knew no matter what, I had a dad right here who was cheering me on. And I want you to know you have a heavenly father who is looking at you and saying, listen, no matter who your Goliath is, I'm right here with you. You might get hurt, but you're not going to lose the ultimate battle because it's one in Christ Jesus. And so what I want to look at today is this God frees us from our fears. I'm not saying that fear will never be there. Matter of fact, you know why we have fear, right? It's just like pain. The reason we have pain it's like physical, physical pain is to know how that hurts. Let's not put my hand on the stove. Right? That lepers in the Bible, that's why they would begin, their body parts would fall off. I know that's graphic. But they couldn't feel the pain, and so therefore they would just continue to hurt themselves and not realize they were hurting themselves. Tie that to fear. Fear is a healthy thing. We went to the zoo a few weeks ago, and our little girl and it was right there, and I'm looking at this ginormous snakes, and I just, I hate snakes, right? I think it's, I have a biblical, you know, just truth there to say snakes are of the devil. <laughs> but there we are at the zoo, and I'm looking at my, you know, my little girl, and this snake is just looking at me, and I just felt like, man, I was in the Garden of Eden almost, and that snake's like, if this wall was not here, I would eat you. I'm like, I know. I have a healthy fear of that thing. See, fear helps us know our, what's going on around us. But when, when anxiety and worry begin to creep in and when fear in its unhealthy place begins to take root in our life, it's no longer that, oh man, Keandre, oh, that anaconda. It's, oh, I, I just don't know if I can drive. I, I, I'm just so anxious. I'm so worried. I'm so worried. And what happens is, man, theologically, this, word, this phrase called the spirit of fear, who is not rooted in God, but it's of the enemy, comes on us and it dominates us and it begins to make us feel like we can't do anything and everything. And it's because we look at life through the lens of fear rather than faith. So I'm not saying that God will take your fear away immediately, 
But what I'm saying is as the fear comes, you can then put on the heavenly perspective, the heavenly lens of faith and say, I know that thing is there, but I know I have a God who's bigger than that. If you're with me, say yes. That's what we're talking about. And so what I want to look at, I want to look at three different things based on the scripture we just read in Samuel of David and Goliath that will help us know that God can man, help us rise above any fear. And the first thing, the first point today is this, don't worry. You ever just been stressed out and you vent to somebody and they just say, hey, don't worry. You're like, I hate you. And it's bad when you're a preacher and you know the scripture and then they quote the scripture at you. I'm like, yeah, I know. You know the scriptures, right? Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. The spirit of, man, God did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. We know the scriptures, but it's when this lens, it's the spirit of fear comes in that we just begin to worry and worry and worry. And I want you to know that we do not have to be dominated by fear. I need you to hear this today. Some of you, you're so quick to listen to what you, you're, the doctor prescribes you. You're so quick to listen to what your therapist tells you to do. All those are good. God can use those things. But why do we not start with the word of God rather than the word of man? Here's what it said in verse 32. David shows up on the scene after 40 days of Goliath punking out the entire Israelite army. He shows up with some bread and cheese, right, for, for his brothers. And he sees all them being punked out. He's like, hey, what's going on? And they begin to tell him, hey, here's what's happening. And if we kill Goliath, we don't have to go to war. And then the king will allow you not to pay taxes and get married. He's like, you know, a 15-year-old kid. He's like, I got this. Hey, don't worry about this Philistine. David told Saul. Remember, at this point in time, David had been anointed as king. He's not king yet. This doesn't happen for about 15 more years. But he knows he's anointed by God. And last week, one of the last scriptures we looked at says that the power of God was with David. So he's not coming about this arrogantly. He just knows that the same God who anointed him is going to be the same God who equips him. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, King Saul says. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. See, when David shows up on the scene, thousands upon thousands upon thousands, not just men, warriors, are so captivated by fear, by this seven foot tall giant, that doesn't know what to do. And when he begins to figure out all the details, he's saying, you mean to tell me, for 40 days, you guys have not done anything. You've let him curse God, and no one has stepped up. I got it. Don't worry. And you would think he's being an arrogant teenager, but he's not. See, he, he knew that God was with him, and he believed that, man, the God who got them to this point, man, taking them away from Egyptian slavery would be the same God to continue his promise. Some of you need to know here today that the same God then is the same God today. And David is saying, don't worry. I'll go. Just willingness. Sometimes, God, the greatest threat that we have against the threat against us is the willingness to stand and be courageous in the midst of fear. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to take place, but I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to jump. We were swimming as a family a few weeks ago, and our little girl had, wasn't really jumping off the edge yet. And there I was. I said, baby, come. And she ran and just jumped. She believed that her dad was going to catch her. She didn't know that she couldn't swim. She got those floaties on. She thinks she's Michael Phelps. And sometimes we think we got to be Michael Phelps to get in the pool. And what God is telling us is you don't even know how to, you don't even need to know how to swim. You just need to jump knowing your heavenly father is going to catch you. But see, you're only. Everybody say you're only. You're only. You're only. Saul's immediate reaction was you're only. You're only old. You're only young. You're only this. You're only that. What's your only? Well, I, I, I just can't because I'm only. I would, but I'm only one. I mean, somebody needs to go and do that, but, but, but not me because I'm only two. 
Well, well I, I, I'm only the. See, the problem was King Saul saw how big our saw how big Goliath was and forgot how big his God was. And when we begin to flirt with our giants, if you will, when we begin to give them more honor, when we begin to give them more prestige, give them more power than our God, that is a recipe for disaster time and time again. Are you with me, church? Oh, I know this is offensive for a lot of people. And I'm so glad. Because the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So what he does is he isolates people and he tells people who they are and who they're not and they're always gonna be this way and you're gonna take it on the chin. And what God is looking for is some men and women, boys and girls that stand up and say, I don't know if I'm gonna win, but I just know in this moment, no one else is doing anything, so therefore I'm gonna stand up and do something. David was so confident, not in his own ability, but he believed that God would help him time and time again. Why did he believe that God would do it? Because God had demonstrated his faithfulness to David time and time again. And that's my second point. He's with you. See, David watched it all along. Here's what it says in verse 34. But David persisted, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. Don't you know, right? You have King Saul and all the army. And this little boy comes up and says, hey, I'll do it. What's your track record? Well, I've been taking care of sheep and goats. Awesome. But check this out. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. And you read that and say, well, of course he's confident against Goliath because he's extremely strong. He's a, he's a mighty warrior. He's actually not. He's just the boy. I mean, yes, he, he, is a warrior. he has a warrior heart. But remember, as I stated earlier, the spirit of God began to come upon David in a very powerful way after Samuel came and anointed him. And so he went back into the field to be the shepherd of the sheep rather than straight to the palace because God knew he needed to learn to be the shepherd of sheep before he was the shepherd of Israel. And, and when he says that he was killing a lion and a bear, which is quite the battle, shall, shall we say. But what he didn't know was the bear and the lion was preparing him for Goliath. And oftentimes we're in the, the season of drought. We're in the wilderness season where, where these trials are coming at us. The bears and the lions, if you will, are coming at us. We're saying, God, where are you in the midst of this? Why is this happening? If you're so good, why are these things attacking me? And little do you know that God might allow those lions and bears to come at you so that way you learn to be strong and courageous then. So that way when thousands of people see that you're, br that you're brave and courageous and beat Goliath, you know it was the same God who gave you the strength then as it was now. And God gets the glory, not David. So the next time you find yourself being prowled around by a lion or a bear and all those things, hopefully that's figuratively. Rather than asking God to remove you from that situation, ask God to strengthen you and equip you to defeat them in that situation. But it goes on to say, I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. See, this wasn't personal to David, as in he's like, the Philistine started attacking his mama. He's not saying, don't you talk about my mama. But instead it's, are you talking about my God? I want you to know, church, we should be so protective. We should be so proud about our God that when people insult, when people say things, not where we get in a mouthing match with them, but where it hurts us. I'm afraid we live in a generation where people can just begin to do whatever they want with the name of God and it doesn't do anything to us because we don't have all in reverence for our God. But it says, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead. He said, and may the Lord be with you. See, Saul was desperate because Saul knew, okay, this is only going to last so much longer. Because they made a deal. The best warrior for the Philistines and the best warrior for the Israelites will have a match. It will save a whole lot of time, money, energy, and bodies. And so one-on-one. -on -one. 
But after a certain point, they were going to have to go to war. And they knew at that point in time that the Philistines were stronger than them. And so David shows up on the scene, as I already stated, and said that I'll go. But what I love so much about this is that David knew. David knew in that moment that his, that his heavenly father was watching him. And guys, I just need you to know this. I keep on hit, hitting on it because, man, this is the foundation of the message. Oftentimes we hear this story with say, man, David's so powerful, David's so mighty. Man, he, he was the one who killed thousands upon thousands upon thousands. But it wasn't about that for David. Before he was in the palace, before there was a crown on his head, he just had reverence for his God. And oftentimes we want the name, we want the prestige for ourselves, somebody to be powerful, to be smart, prestigious, whatever it is. And what our number one desire needs to be as Christ followers is to be a child of God. What does that have anything to do with not being captivated by fear? Well, when you know who you, you are, you get to walk in that confidence. Some of you, you're walking around. I'm talking to Christians here. Look up at me if you will. Some of you have been walking around. I'm talking to the, the adults, those who have been in the church a long time. You've been walking around with this mediocre relationship with God where you're saved, you're forgiven, you're loved, but you're not walking around in the confidence that, man, that's my God. I remember a time that, you know, they would have parents come in. It was like, a, what, what's your parent do for a living day? And I remember one day here in Marshall, my dad came in and it was teaching people to box. I, I, I doubt that would go over very well today. But I remember just, you know, there in, in, that, in that classroom seeing a bunch of kids just learn how to box. And, and I was just so proud. I was so proud. I'm like, man, that like, man, that's my dad. And, and I'm here all these years later, not talking about my earthly dad, but my, my heavenly dad. I'm just so proud that he's my dad. And I, and I know if I'm in this season, God's with me. And I know if I'm going through this, my God's with me. And if there's a lot, my God's with me. And there's a little, my God's with me. In sickness, my God's with me. And in, in health, my God's with me. When there's plenty, my God's with me. And when there's little, my God is with me because my dad loves me and cares for me. And some of you here today have been operating in this way that you think that you are relying on your own strength. But as David said, may the, as Saul told David, may the Lord God be with you. David already knew the Lord God was with him because he'd been with him all along. How has God showed up in your life up to this point? And some of you say, man, I don't know, man. I, God hasn't really been there. I want you to know God has been there. You just haven't seen him. Others of you, you know what God has done in your life. You've seen what God has personally done to you and your family. And I say this all the time, so man, excuse me for being annoying. But I see so many people come, oh my gosh, I could preach so many sermons on this. People come to the Lord so broken. Oh, my life's in shambles. I'm, I'm addicted. I'm broken and all these things. And it's a beautiful place to be in. It really is. You're, you're completely just desperate for God. And so what he does is he begins to redeem. He begins to use you. He begins to heal you and restore you and your marriage. And then all of a sudden, you get money back in your account. Your wife doesn't hate you as much anymore. Man, things are you know, go going good. Your kids love you. They're proud of you. And then you begin to think that you got yourself here and you get prideful. And you forget that it was God who got you here, not yourself. And that's why Saul was removed from his kingdom. And meanwhile, right after, not right after, but shortly after David kills Goliath, he ends up being in the palace, not as king yet, but God had a plan. Guys, I tell you that because when we begin to operate in our own strength, God will never be able to use us to our full capacity because it's about us rather than him. And our third and, and final point here today is eventually you just gotta throw the stone. Would you say that with me, please? Throw the stone. What are you talking about? What, what, what is the stone? The stone is the physical representation of your faith. The stone is the, the thing where you know, man, it's all you got. It's, it's not much, but it's something. It might not be compared to Goliath's sword, but it's something. 
And there comes a point in time where you've got to, man, release that, trust God with it. Here's what it says in verse 48. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down to the ground. If you leave it up on the screen, it says David quickly. Everybody say quickly. Come on now. He quickly ran out. See, Goliath moved closer. I want you to know the Bible tells us it's not if we have trials, it's when. And I'm not saying every single day you need to be looking for a trial. That will not go well. But what I'm getting at is you need to know that trials are coming. And see, what I love about David was when the battle approached him, when the enemy approached him, he wasn't like, oh, let me go pray real quick. Oh, let, 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 let me read real quick. Let, let me go work out real quick. Let me go try to, you know, just try it out on a bear real quick. He had been practicing. He had been in tune with the Lord. So when the battle came, he was ready. I'm afraid we have a lot of Christians who are not ready for battle. I know nothing about the military battle. And I'm so grateful for those who serve our country. But I want you to know we are in a spiritual battle. And too many Christians do not know what to do when the battle comes their way. Can I get an amen, somebody? If you don't think I'm correct, I got news for you. You're wrong. Had a filter there. Hey, man, so, so, okay, yeah, I hear that's going on. So, so what's your prayer life looking like? And are you fasting? Are you, see, are you seeking counsel? No, no man, I just, I'm so paralyzed by it. See, I, I just can't help but think that maybe there were some warriors in the midst of those 40 days that were like, man, maybe I'll do it. And don't you know, I'm not saying it's in there, it might not be in there, but, or it might not have happened, but maybe just maybe some were like, man, I might do it. And someone said, hey, shut up, man. Goliath's gonna kill you. Because they were all together looking at the same thing. And some of you, your community is all looking at the same thing. And so when somebody on the outside comes in with a different perspective, you get offensive. You're just a little boy. You're just two. You're only. So, hey, c come. Let's brainwash you and try to put you part of this. You stay here in your own bubble. Just do this. Don't grow your business for the glory of God. Keep it safe. Don't work on your marriage. It's fine the way it is. Don't go back to school. That's silly. Don't just stay right here. Just do what your mom's done and she's done. And don't, don't, don't go and lose weight. That'd be the, no, just stay right here. Hey, man, don't, don't, don't begin to work on these bad habits. Just you know, come on. We all do it. It's just a hobby. It's just what we do. And then somebody from the outside says, hey, you know there's a different way of doing it. I'm not saying that they're perfect. But guys, I'm here to tell you, we need some accountability in our life. We need an outside perspective. We need a different lens, a lens not of fear, but a face. And I got news for you. There's a different way of going about this. And when David got through the lies of everyone else, his brothers, get away. Go back home, you little boy. And Saul, who are you, you little runt? David says, I'll go. And there he is. He puts on all of Saul's armor, because that's what you're supposed to do, right? I mean, you got to do whatever, you, know, you got to look the part. And because, you know, Saul's the king, he's got the big sword, he's got the big gear. That's what you need to do. But he gets in there and he just says, I I've never done this before. I I'm slower than normal. I, I, I don't know how to do All I know to do is to use this little stone. So he takes off the gear. He has the stones. And when Goliath begins to run out to him, he didn't step back and go, oh, my gosh. The little 15-year-old boy goes to the big giant and confronts him. 
And some of you here today, you're not at 15 years old. Some of you are, but you're acting like a 15-year-old, and you think that you need to kind of go back, and, well, I don't want to just make it messy. I, I don't want to hurt anybody. Or, man, this is just the way that it needs to be. And what God is looking for you to do is be courageous and run right to that stinking giant. What is your Goliath in this place, ma'am? Sir, what is your Goliath? I'm so passionate about this stuff because I've seen it in my own life. I'm too. I'm not going to be able to. And I don't know what to do. But in those moments, this whole, I put my pants on like they put their pants on. It's no longer egotistical. It's saying, I know my God's got a track record of being good. So why it's not much, I'm going to grab this stone and throw it as hard as I can at the giant. And some of you, you've been influenced by the world. You need to put this on and do this and this, and God will use all, all things. But I'm here to tell you, you will not win the spiritual battle with worldly weapons. You will only win the spiritual battle and the physical battles with spiritual weapons first. But here's what I love. It sank into his head and he goes down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone for he had no sword. Some of you say, man, I tell him I wish I could, but man, I just don't have any. What's your stone? What's your stone? Moms, dads, I'm sorry if you have kids in here. A little graphic, but I'm sure they watch worse on YouTube. Those ads will get you, let me tell you. And David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. And David used it to kill him and cut his head off. Netflix doesn't have anything on the Bible. Here's what I love. The same thing that Goliath taunted David with was the same thing that David triumphed over him with. And it was a sword. Because what the enemy intended for harm, God will use for good. And you're not in the season that you're in because of your disobedience and your sins because God wanted you there. No, he didn't. God doesn't want us to engage in sin. That is not his will for our life. But check this out. God will use those situations in the darkness for his glory. And the same thing that try to kill you will be the thing that'll allow you to have triumph. And so some of you here today, you're walking around paralyzed by fear. Listen, hear me out. I am not saying don't go to the doctors. I am not saying don't go to the counselors. Do it. You better believe it. Do you pray about it as much as you worry about it? Can I get one amen in this place? Why are we so quick to trust what the world says and so quick to not do what the word of God says? So God frees us of our fears. Sometimes he takes it away immediately. Sometimes he allows us to triumph in the midst of it. If God hasn't removed the fear, the threat, keep praying, allow him to give you the strength in the midst of it. But here's what I wanna ask you in closing. What you got in your back pocket? Figuratively. Might not be much. But we all got a stone. You can go get a stone outside. Why don't you stand, if you will? I've seen personally, firsthand, the attacks of the enemy in my own life, in my wife's life, my family's life, friends and peers. And I'm here to tell you, I will not diagnose you. I will not tell you what you're going through is not real, it is. But I need you to know What you feel and the truth are not always the same thing. What you feel is real. 
but what you're thinking doesn't mean it's always true. And some of you Satanists told you this is gonna be your life forever. Your mom had this and, your, and their mom had this and it's just the way it is, it's mental and it's, you're always gonna be that way. I want you to know God can heal you. He can heal you through removing it or he can heal you by giving you the strength through it. But here's what I know. Some of you, like little 12 year old me, looking at your own Goliath, Keandre, you're not gonna remember anything I said today except for that. Man, I just want you to figuratively, knowing you got a heavenly father on the sideline who's been preparing you for this moment. You've been reading the word, you're fasted up, you're ready to go. And you know that dude's coming. You know that thing's coming. But you're ready. You're ready because your God is with you. I want you to close your eyes in this place. Sound mind for the spirit of fear. I feel your presence, Lord. My goodness gracious. You can taste it. Whew. Some of you, I see it, man. I see this fog being lifted off. Some of you, you might think I'm crazy. That's fine. What is prophecy? Yes, it's foreknowledge. But more times than not in Scripture, it's speaking over. It's believing. And I'm believing here in this place People want freedom. I'm not saying that fear won't be there on Monday, but when it's sitting there for you Monday, you know, I'm going back to the Word. It ain't a Sunday thing, it's an everyday thing. I'm gonna wake up early, I'm gonna go to bed late, getting the Word in me. No, and I'm not taking it on the chin and thinking this is all that it is. I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm gonna take the pill, I'm gonna do this, because that's all I can do, and God is in that, but I'm telling you, it's time to learn to fight. It's time to get on your hands and knees and say, God, I need you. God, I want you. Get your word in me, Lord. Help me, God. If you're here in this place and you need a sound mind, you need to be free of this fear, I want you to lift a hand in this place. Lift it up all over this place. The altars are open. We're gonna do some, we're gonna let God work in this place. Come down, altars are open. Sing it, team.